Not Ron, not Destin, just your friendly neighborhood international missions pastor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so a, a week ago, right now, I was flying over Greenland, right? And it was funny because Brandon did not realize that I was away and he's texting me and I had the T-Mobile plan. And I was like texting him. I'm like, sorry, Brandon, I can't, I can't, I, I can't make fun of you right now about Baylor beating you. Um, I'm actually over Greenland. And um, it was just a fun little interaction there. Had a great time uh, in, uh, in, in Africa, actually. Uh, learned a lot about Africa. Uh, learned, um, I, was, I was staying with these hosts, and, and I saw this pond in the back of their, in the back of their uh, house, and I was asking about wildlife and everything, because I'd already seen some spider monkeys, and uh, that was really cool, you know? It's like, they got stray spider monkeys. Like, we have stray dogs. And I'm just thinking, that's awesome right? Uh, I went to play with them. And they were like, no, you really don't. Don't do that. And so then I said, well, what else is around? And he said, well, there's an alligator that lives in the pond behind our house. I'm like, oh, well, that's great. And I said, well, do you ever see it? And he goes, no, actually at night, you can see its yellow eyes if you go out there. And I'm like, okay, check mark, not going out at night. I'm good. I'm going to stay here in the comfort of the house. And I was like, what, what else is around? You know? And he said, well, we do have a lot of snakes. And I was, and I'm thinking about snakes like, like are snakes like in Lantana where I live, you know? And he was like, no, no, our, our, you know, we have, we have like anaconda and uh, boa constrictors and black mambas. And I'm like, oh, this is so good. It just keeps getting better. Um, and, uh, you know, cause I'm, I'm thinking about the reality that I've seen like horses or, you know, cattle eaten by anaconda, right? I mean, I don't, I, I, and, and I'm looking at this little space underneath the front door. I'm like, can an anaconda come through there? Like how, you know, I'm just, just staying up at night, looking around, checking things out, you know, and you may have been, you may have entered this week going, oh my goodness, Thanksgiving is here. All of these relatives and the cooking and is Kroger going to be stocked with anything? And you know what? You're not being chased by an anaconda. All right. And so this is going to be a good week for you. It's going to be a good week. It's going to be a good week of Thanksgiving and gratefulness. And uh, I'm, I'm here uh, to speak a little bit about um, what happens internationally. And then we're going to dial it into a specific theme that I want to address that I believe has been on my heart for some time. And, and, and I want to share this with you. Um, as we jump into it, though, I'm going to take about five minutes and take you on a trip around the world. And so five minutes around the world, that's a whole lot longer than my 27 hour journey last week, I tell you, all right? But we're gonna do it and I wanna do it because you know what? We give as members and attenders of this church in so many different ways. And one of the ways you give is financially. And as you give, um, it fuels what happens around the world that we're connected to. And so whenever you drop those dollars in a box in the back or as you give online, there's a variety of ways that that is involving missions internationally as well. And you see, we have this friendship that we've developed over the last 10 years with a guy by the name of Elio and his wife, Ladies. And they have been here. They've talked on the stage a couple of times. They live in Havana. They have a church named Alamanderas Church. And Elio and I were talking. And because of the damage that has happened within an already ravaged country um, due to COVID and so many other issues at play within their government, there's a lot of people that have been starving this year. And it's either because they have money and they can't find food or they don't have money and there is food. And so as you look at all of the situations there and as we begin to pray and talk about that, um, it's really cool to see what happened because this, uh, this partnership was forged. And, 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 and it was the coolest thing because it was the Western Baptist Convention of Cuba. Yes, that really does exist. Right? And the government of Cuba and Feed the Hunger and Elio and all of these parts, they all came together. And now the food that we packed at the beginning of this week and whenever Feed the Hunger, all that food that we packed is going in a shipping container and added to other food so that this 40 foot shipping container of food is going to Havana to feed people that we know and love that desperately need it. And that's a huge blessing, right? It's awesome. It's awesome to see what God is up to. And that's going to be going out in a few weeks. 
um, uh, Rehoboth India Missions, um, we, we're we partnered with India in some really cool ways with church planting and uh, so many other things. And Sastri and Paige Misal are a part of that ministry. Uh, Josh, Joshua was born um, this, uh, this year to them. And it just goes to show you that missions is a part of addition and multiplication in so many ways. Um, See, I told 915 y'all would laugh at that and you didn't. So we're just going to move on. Um, But there was also relief work that occurred in India uh, because COVID-19 really had a lot of impact in some very severe ways around the globe when people couldn't work and when there were food shortages and when borders were closed, even to food shipments that were not getting there. And so as that occurred, uh, church planting uh, kind of uh, stalled a little bit. They were still in training. They mowed. They were still working and planting. And now they've ramped up again and three quick, quick stories uh, from Yasana. Uh, Yasana is a modern day Saul turned Paul. He was physically persecuting Christians in India and then God grabbed his heart and that Hindu became a follower of Jesus and now he's planting churches Pretty cool, pretty cool as well. Eliah and his wife, Mary, you see their son right in front of them. You know what they named him? John Wesley. Yeah, they named him John, John Wesley. You know, actually, Eliah was uh, cured of a, of, a, of a, well, actually, he, was, he, he became a believer from a Christian tract that somebody had given him. And, uh, and now what happens is he and his wife are planting two churches. But then we also have uh, Jacob and his sweet family. Uh, they're planting a church in a village called Nagaluti. And that particular village, only Islam and Muslim uh, are uh, Muslim uh, faith and Hindu faith are in this village. There is no Christian influence at all, but God, he believes God has called him to there. And you know what? God's called him there. He's listening to, to, to God's voice, but you know how all that started? He was a Hindu who had a serious stomach illness and God saved him, not only from the illness, he healed him from the illness, but out of that miraculous healing, he then gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And now he's in the middle of mission in a very challenging place. And it's a good, good testimony of what God has been doing in India. Kids connect for Jesus back up and running. They never really stopped running. It's just, uh, you know, things kind of slowed out a bit because there weren't mission groups coming. And now there are again, they've got medical teams that are there. They've got a worship facility that has been built now so that teams can bring, come there and be a part of some really incredible moments together as they bring the community together in worship and ministry. Um, We're going to be doing a mission trip, as a matter of fact, Uh, be be headed back to Belize, a family mission trip in June. We're holding those plans loosely, but we believe that God's called us to place that on the calendar. And if that's something that you're interested in, we'd love to talk to you about that. World Link Ministries, that's another place that we're connected to in Cuba on the east side. Holguin uh, is on the east where Havana is on the west. And in, in Holguin, we've got 34 church planters that have been planting churches. And even in 2020, The word has been given to us that they've planted 30 churches over the last year, even in the midst of COVID. Ben and Chilla Spinks and Richard and Heather Vanderdice, many of you know these names because they came out of our church. They live in Transylvania, uh, Romania now, which not everybody can say they live in Transylvania. There's even a Hotel Transylvania if you'd like to go visit. But you know, Richard and Heather Vanderdice welcomed Zoe into the world on April 19th. Yet again, God's multiplication. But that's not all that happened. You see, they've also been involved in therapy for children with special needs through the horse ministry that they have there. They've also been involved in gospel-centered ministry in orphanages and providing family and kids camps and providing tech support for other missions and ministries. Bucky Elliott, an international commission, they're involved in helping indigenous congregations around the world with one-on-one evangelism. Bill and Peg Pearson are still in the DR following God's call post-retirement to plant church churches. They've planted four. There's about to be a fifth. We've got uh, Brett Medlin with Rock Foundation. He's in Cambodia, loving on the people there. They've been doing ministry in 2020 like nobody's business. Actually, since May, they've actually, and this is so incredible, they've drilled already 10 uh, wells for clean, clean water in, in that area. And they've, and they've been uh, giving out 70,000 pounds, 73,000 pounds of food, as well as beginning the process now that restrictions have opened up in giving the Jesus film to 
places all around their community that need to hear the gospel. Doc Henry is involved in China in partnership with us. Jerry and Janice Smith are in Ecuador and in their partnership, our men's ministry has gone down there multiple times, is planning on going again in 2022. They've opened up a school with 60 kids, even during coronavirus, and their church continues to expand. And they are a missions partner with Compassion International, and we get to support them in those efforts. Tim and Krista Ashworth are working with refugees in Germany. And Baby Chen and Susan Varghese, going back to India again, are a part of the ministry B-World, where they actually partner with church pastors who have become believers mostly mostly because they actually discovered who Jesus was because he came to him in a dream. There are a variety of healings that have taken place, a variety of supernatural encounters, but most of the people that are planting churches in the northwestern quadrant of India have come to Christ in supernatural means that are outside of, you see, what oftentimes we perceive to be the boundaries of God. <laughs> And they get to work with them in some really, really amazing ways. Lay up treasures in heaven. Uh, that's a men of Nehemiah focused program that was started by Patrick, who was the first graduate of the men of Nehemiah program downtown here. Now he's in Togo working with that program there and we support them. Predominantly 20 year old men who are addicted, who are entering that program and finding Jesus Christ and finding relief and recovery and discipleship mission help in Nepal lay up treasures in heaven, as well as Jeffrey Mutunga, the Wells of Joy in Kenya. We got to visit them two years ago. They're back up and running again after COVID began to open some things up again. And they're in the slum, in Lunga Lunga slum, giving kids a safe place to not only be educated, but be discipled as well and free from child trafficking. And Grangu Mission in Haiti, Port-au-Prince, doing a similar work where they've started a home that is run for abandoned and at-risk children. See, all of these ministries, as well as Reach Out Youth Solutions, are involved around the world at Reach Out. We've actually started four new countries of training in youth leadership and development as we evangelize and disciple the next generation, also in Liberia and Niger and India and Honduras. You see, over 13 countries in East Africa where we are as reach out, there have been over 850 leaders trained, over 2,000 teens saved, and nine churches planted. Those are just some of the things that have happened around the world as a result of what giving and commitment to an international focus of seeing all the world find Jesus looks like. And you've been a part of that. That's good news. You can clap on that. That's good. (laughs) And so what you would imagine is that then I would come after this as often happens on a feed the hunger Sunday and give you a missional sermon about some incredible story internationally that is tied to a gospel centric story in the Bible that we all walk away from and go, yes, I'm so glad the church is doing that. But this morning, there's a little twist. You've probably heard of the 1040 window. In the 1040 window, we've got those lines of latitude that are 10 degrees and 40 degrees. And it's the least reached people group in the world. This is comprising 5.1 billion people. And in this grouping of people, we see uh, 8,700 distinct ethnic groups from North Africa through the Middle East into Asia, 68 countries wide. It is the majority of the world's Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists. And for 25 years plus, the church, evangelical church, has been focused on the 1040 window. And I think we need to keep that focus there. And as a matter of fact, what you heard over that five minute commercial of our church's activity, much of what I spoke about would have been included in and around that 1040 window. You see, that's, that's a cause, that's a missional moment. That's something that we are going to still be about. But some of you may have looked at the title if you were looking online or if you were involved on a screen somewhere and you saw that the The title for this message was the 1030 window. And you guys thought, oh, that's so sweet. Well, Randy doesn't know how to write, but that's okay. 
But you know what? The 1030 window is what we're going to talk about today. It is a missional movement. It is a missional focus. And it's a focus that we need to be about from the 20, from the 10 year olds to the 30 year olds in our world. It's a window that we are talking about right now as the church global that we have to, as the big C church, get behind. We have to recognize that right now we are falling behind in reaching the 10 to 30 year old window in our world. You see, the world is getting younger. It's just our country that's getting older. Well, us in Europe primarily. But that blip on the screen of us reaching our zenith years in a generation occurred in 2006. And now we're on the steady decline. Our average age is 38 and a half years old. Whereas the average age in Liberia, where I was just last week, you see, is 19 years old. And so as we begin to look at what's happening in the world and what our, responsibil- what our responsibility is and what God is calling us to, one of the stats that is just staggering to me is that between the ages of 10 and 30, there are approximately 2.2 billion students and children who do not know Jesus. You just let that sink into you for just a minute. In our world, 2.2 billion people within the ages of 10 and 30 who don't know Jesus. What do we do? How do we reach them? Where do we go? And I would say there are some things that are happening in our world that are incredible. There there are some phenomena. And let 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 me say this. I'm on my way home. And I get this, uh, I get this uh, confirmation email from, uh, from Air France that says, um, you have been confirmed on these legs of your journey. And, and to get to actually get to Monrovia, I went from Dallas to Detroit, which makes total sense. And then from Detroit to Paris, and then from Paris to Monrovia. And when I got the confirmation, it said, you have been confirmed from Paris to Detroit and Detroit to Dallas. Do you see the problem? And so I, I, I did what I really wanted to do uh, last Saturday was spend about an hour on phone trying to talk to Air France. And I finally got on the phone with them and I said, here's the issue. You don't have me on this flight. And they said, oh, you're actually correct. Yes, uh, that flight was canceled and you're, not, you're no longer on that flight. I said, I think my family wants to see me at Thanksgiving. Like, can we figure this out? Because you got me here. I need to get home. And they said, well, we really can't help you. And I was like, well, actually, no, I really do need your help. Well, we can't help you. Well, who can help me? Well, maybe Delta can help you. So I did what I really, really, really wanted to do was then be on hold with Delta. And so I hop on the phone and I'm talking to, talking to nobody because I'm just listening to the musical music over and over and over again. And finally somebody comes on and I, I appeal to them my situation and they go, okay, well, let me put you on hold. And they put me on hold and they come back and they're like, okay, we think we've got it. Now, if we could just put you on hold, uh, we've been given permission to talk to somebody about your situation. And I'm thinking, what was the first, it was like the first one was like a smoke break. I mean, what was the, I don't understand all of this, but okay, I'll just wait. I'll be in the queue. I'm just, I'm just here. I'm in Monrovia. I'm chilling. I can't go anywhere because you can't, you won't let me. And so finally they come back on the phone and they're like, good news. We've got you on a flight from Monrovia to Paris. All is fixed. We've got you on a seat. You're, you're going to be, you're going to be just fine. Say, why did you tell me your journey right there? I mean, that was all just kind of boring with moderate laughter. Here's the reason. Here's the reason. The reason is because as the church, it just hit me symbolically. As the church, we do a great job with Dallas to Detroit. I mean, our worship is, I mean, we do great weekend experiences. I mean, we bottle them. We even sell them in a concert form and people pay money for those moments. Right? I mean, we do a great job of it. We do a great job of Detroit to Paris. Our church planting is solid, right? I mean, we've got church planting networks like crazy. I just showed you some of the ones that our church is a part of. And there, there are church plants popping up all over. And that's all fine and good. And we've got to still be doing these things. We need those legs of the journey. But can I just tell you, if this generation is going to pass on to the next generation, what was passed on to us, we've got to be focused on the next generation. You see, that leg of the journey, there's a red light flashing. And it's in critical mode. And the reason it's in critical mode right now is because there are a lot of focused areas that we're about, 
But one of the ones that really concern, uh, scares us, one of the ones that we kind of are shying away from, one of the ones that we just kind of step back and say, well, surely somebody else is going to do it, just happens to be young adults to children. You say, well, why is that, Randy? Why is, why is it that youth pastors are in the decline in our city, in our country, in our world? Why is it that seminary professors came together just a month and a half ago and said they're seeing fewer people come out of our seminaries focused on youth ministry than ever before? Why is it that the focus isn't what it used to be? There's a lot of reasons for that, and we can talk for a long time this afternoon about it, if you'd like. Well, actually, I've got some other plans, but you could just kind (laughs) of pretend like you're talking to me. But I... I believe what's happened is we've got a lot of priorities that are good things, but we're losing that third leg. You say, is that really true, Randy? I mean, come on. Our church has got lots of things planned for kids. We've got lots of things planned for students. We know, we, we've got more people working with students and children than maybe ever before in our church. I mean, surely, I mean, this isn't even recruitment Sunday. Wasn't this message supposed to be like in August? And the answer is no. The answer is for some crazy reason, God's placed me in this seat in this moment to have a lot of conversations with a lot of people and do a lot of study about what's happening generationally. And I just can't let go of it. And I need to tell as many people as I can because we're about to face a tsunami. And if you're not aware of it, you're going to become aware of it. Generation after generation after generation gets different names. There, there, there are a variety of generations that you are familiar with, uh, that you are involved in, that you are a part of. I mean, we've got generations like the silent generation. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands because then that becomes incriminating and you can always pretend that you're a part of the, 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 the later one. And that's fine. But generation, silent generation, 1928 to, to 45. Baby boomers, 46 to 64. Generation X, that's my generation, 65 to 80. I even got a woo out of that. That's cool. Um, Millennials, 81 to 96. There you go. There you go. Uh, For those of you that are here and still in bed, that's your generation right there. (laughs) Generation Z, 97 to 2010. They didn't even give that generation 15 full years. Uh, You know, they they just started automatically. I mean, they're like, we got to move on past that generation. Let's just get on to Generation Alpha. Whatever. I, he, here's, here's what's really critical about this, though. When you start looking at Generation Z and Generation Alpha, those generations look more like each other. There's a coalescing there of those young people than ever before in the history of our world. Why? Because of this and this. You see, now they all just look more and more the same. So before we would go do a mission trip and it would be like, whoa, that culture is so different. They talk different. They think different. They want different things. They're involved in different things. And now we go to different places around the world. And it's just even in Liberia when I was there. And it's just amazing. You know, you get into the front of seeing all these teenagers and they want to be the same things that American teenagers want. And they want to dress just like them. And they want, you know, it's all coalescing around. And there is some interesting pieces to that missiologically that we don't want to miss because you see we have a moment here to express the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that the whole world can see and experience and know and receive like never before but it also comes with its challenges and so we've got generation z sitting there also describing themselves in some really challenging ways so I was reading this study about Generation Z and they did this multiple choice test and they tested all of these Generation Z kids and, and, and they came up with this conclusion that when it came to work ethic, the one thing that they described themselves as more than any other was this choice. It was, we work harder than anybody else when we want to. Maybe they describe themselves that way because their, their parents are millennials. I don't know. We'll just move on. Just give millennials a hard time because I'm Generation X. That's all. But the reality is we've got some real challenges with Gen Z, right? 
You say, oh, well, what does that really mean? What does that really look like? How do we really? Well, there was an interesting study as we were looking at Gen Z and we discovered that, you know, obviously TikTok is more popular with them than Instagram. And they're more ethnically diverse than any generation we've ever had. They're also the social justice warriors of their day. So whether it's BLM or Me Too or LGBTQ, they're more accepting and open-minded. In our country, almost half of them are considered, quote-unquote, minority. They spend more of their time on their phones than previous generations did watching TV. And that's hard to believe when you consider some of the Gilligan's Island binging that occurred in my generation. For the U.S., Gen Z has been the largest generation in American history and most probably will be the largest one that ever existed as we get older. But in a recent article by Tim Elmore, he describes Generation Z by using a popular TV show. He says, if you've not ever heard of Squid Game or viewed it, it's probably a good thing. But it's a Netflix show that has become the most popular Netflix show in 82 of the 85 countries where that platform exists. It's extremely popular among Gen Zers, so much so that, and I don't fully understand this because I've not watched the show, but uh, white vans slip-on sales are up 7,800% worldwide. There's an uptick in teens wanting to learn Korean. You say, well, why are they so attracted to that show? I mean, it's in subtitles, right? (laughs) It's because the characters in the show appeal to them because they're the marginalized groups of society. Because they're the elite and blue collar and undocumented and elderly. And what they find on the show is gory and graphic and disturbing. And why is that attractive? Because psychologists tell us it's the law of diminishing returns, right? Because when something feels intriguing and fresh, the effects eventually wear off and don't bring us the same wow factor. So it requires greater doses of that feeling later. And Gen Zers have been exposed to virtually everything in this unfiltered life of violence and pornography and graphic images and disturbing visuals within their lives. It takes them more and more and more to be stimulated. They identify with this situation of victims who are cash strapped and distressed and attempting to escape debt. Some of you are like, well, I identify with that. That's Gen Z. That's a picture of Gen Z. And so those are the teens and the young adults that are living among us now. And there's great things to say about them. In so many ways, they want to change the world and are doing so. But then they've also got these younger brothers and sisters that are in Generation Alpha. I didn't know a whole lot about Generation Alpha. Christy McCallum actually challenged me. We were going to do a study with children's leaders in a seminar. And she said, hey, would you do a Generation Alpha talk for me? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. And then we hung up the phone. And I was like, oh, my goodness, what is that? I, I just, I hadn't read anything about it. And I started to do study. And then I started studying sociologists and psychologists all around the world in India and Australia and the UK and other parts of Europe and a little bit in our country, not so much. We're actually lagging behind in this. And they're all coming together with this one picture about what generation alpha looks like. And it's what you need to know. Some of you are living with generation alpha right now. There are 2.8 million of them that are being born in our world every week. And when they're all born from 2010 to 2025, there will be 2.2 billion. They will be, ready for this, the largest generation the world has ever seen. The countries where the most of them will, will live and reside will be India, China, and Indonesia, but population is increasing in this generation in Africa, even in countries like Liberia, where the age of teenage years and younger is 52%. And in many of African countries, the median age continues to get younger and younger at 19 and 18 and 17 and 16 years old. They're the children of the millennials. 
And there's a variety of labels that are attached to them. Maybe the label that makes the most sense is Generation Glass. Because you see, glass has been in front of their face ever since they were born. It is and has been their pacifier. Not just in our culture, but in all cultures. There's a lot of effect to that. There's some interesting demographics. And when we walk through this, for some of you, you're going to look at this and you're going to go, that's not me. That's not my kid. That's not what we're raising. Okay, well, this is a big swath of humanity that we're looking at, right? This is the world within this demographic, within this sliver that is the 2.2 billion that's entering into adolescence next year. And it may not exactly represent you. It may not exactly represent our church. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, you know, I'm going to protect, I'm going to protect the message here so that we don't get all offended in the room and just say, you know what? Our church has a student ministry and a children's ministry, and you are a parent. And there are things that are happening that are wonderful in our church and churches in our area and around the world. But for the last 15 minutes that we're together, can I just say to you that what I'm seeing and what sociologists and missiologists are seeing is that there is a call and a need for us to do even more. What do we see? Demographically, parents are older, culturally diverse, slightly wealthier, smaller family sizes, longer life expectancy. And there's that work ethic question. And you're like, but they're 12 years old and younger. What do you know about work ethic right now? Whether they're looking at their older brothers and sisters. What about their formulative years? Here's what we're finding uh, in, in our country specifically. The eight to 12 year olds in our country are spending on average four hours and 45 minutes of screen time per day. That's not educational. I, does that concern you at all? The, the, there's some interesting impact to that. One is that they're the, they're the most digitally literate generation that's ever lived. But they've also developed the shortest attention span we've ever seen on the face of humanity. And that's a concern for sociologists because here's what's happening. At a point in time when adults should be running two kids to parent them and mentor them and coach them and love them and care for them, we are concerned about their behavioral issues and their emotional quotient so much that we run away from them and tell them, oh, go play. Here's an iPad. And I see educators nodding their heads in the room because that's real life in 21st century America too. There's a shorter attention span. They're easily overwhelmed. There's a lower emotional quotient. And they're finding as they test these kids that there's a lagging behind in social formation, critical thinking skills, ability to assess risk, ability to develop practical skills and hand on competencies, leadership skills and abilities. All of these areas, but that's not all. They're finding with these kids that there's isolation and significant antisocial behavior an early onset of pornography down into the nine and 10 year old age. Screen addiction, cyberbullying, and gender confusion. They're parented by a more progressive society that's caused them to become the blurred line generation. There's a blurred line now between gender. What is it? Work. In family life, is my mom, is my dad working or are they home to be with me? Public, private, is my health public or is it private? Is what I'm doing online public or is it private? The blurred line of truth. What is it? Do I know it? Does it even exist? And then globally what we see in this upcoming generation and the Generation Z group is that their camps, religious largely fall in two categories. There's the category of, I believe all religions are good. Everything is permissive. Everything goes. And the other camp that's just as large, that says religion is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. It's not that I'm atheistic or agnostic. It's just that it's irrelevant to me. Those are the two largest camps of quote unquote religion in Generation Z and Alpha. 
So where does that leave the middle? The place where the cross exists. The place where John speaks of Jesus' message saying, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father through me, but through me. The exclusivity of Jesus, that doesn't really live in those two camps with 20-something-year-olds all the way down to the three-year-old, younger than three yet to be born. How do we reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, it comes down to why we do what we do. Do we really understand it? As a church, I, I think we do. I mean, we, we, have it, we have it on the wall. And I think we've memorized it pretty well, right? That, that we're to love God with all that we are while making more and better followers of Christ. And we know that that comes out of two greats, right? The great commission and the great commandment. We're just going to love God and we're going we're gonna to reach everybody that we can. But do we also believe that there's a commandment in Psalm 78 that speaks about turning our attention toward our children and to the next generation so that they set their hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Do we believe that to be true beyond just the fact that we drop them off in the children's ministry, but the fact that that's true for all believers to pass the torch, to impress them on your children, Deuteronomy 6. Verse five, to train up a child in the way that he should go. When he is old, he will not return from it. How do we keep a young man pure? Do we believe this, that it's really about God's word in his heart? First Corinthians 11, one, that's one of the biggest challenges that we have found globally with stepping into the next generation. It's because even in Liberia, last week, when I was hanging out with those leaders, you know, we were speaking in the seminary, we were were talking with pastors and with teachers, and one of the biggest challenges that we found was, they said, we don't feel ready to speak into the next generation because of our own life. Because where we are, we're not modeling what we need to model. And maybe that's what's kept you from taking a step toward them and instead taking a step away from them. Because on the inside, you just feel like, ah, I just don't, I'm not ready. I'm not worthy. I don't know that I'm an example that I want them to follow. The time is now. We know in Psalm 71, The psalmist says, my confidence since my youth, you see, to say we are planting the hope of glory in them. Before what? Before in Ecclesiastes 12, one, before the days of trouble come and they find, I I find no pleasure in them. So whether you go to Esther or Josiah or David or Mary or Timothy or Joseph, the list is long of teenagers who were used by God in the Bible. I don't think that's by accident. I think that was purposeful. And then, crazy enough, you get to Matthew chapter 17. And in Matthew chapter 17, you know what happens toward the end of that chapter? Jesus ends up getting some coins to give to Peter to go pay the temple tax. Which makes perfectly good sense because in Exodus chapter 30, the temple tax is discussed. Here's the crazy part. The temple tax was for who? Everybody who was age 20 and older. So the temple tax Jesus gave Peter was for two of them, which causes me to believe, and there is some heresy in this, I realize this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. The chosen might be a little wrong. I like the chosen, but I'm thinking quite possibly most of those people playing those parts needed to be 16, 17, 18 year olds because the temple tax was paid for the youth pastor who was Jesus and the adult leader of the group, which was Peter. And there was a bunch of teenagers running around and that was the first youth group. And they were hanging around and Jesus was using that group of teenagers to see the world transformed. But is that a real surprise? Is it a real surprise because teenagers were used since the Bible was written? 
I guess it really makes sense if you look at it in the context of 1 Corinthians 1, where Paul says, brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. We look at teenagers and we go, oh, so foolish, so immature. And yet God looks at them and says, there's an opportunity. They are quite possibly the most underutilized group in the church. They are the under challenged group that the church big C needs to see as yes, they're foolish and goofy and hyper, but they're also idealist and visionary and unrealistic. They don't know they can't do it until all of a sudden they've done it. And so we get this report two weeks ago in my office from Burundi that's seen an increase in Christian persecution, even though they're a Christian country, there's a lot of stuff going on there. And there's this big evangelistic meeting that's about to take place. And the students who have come to Christ and are being discipled in this community have gotten together in groups of three. They're just doing what Jesus called us to do. Get in groups of two and three and pray and watch God show up. So they were doing it. And in the context of this moment, as they're praying for this evangelistic experience, that's also a training for church leaders in their community, soldiers come into the church. And they stand there watching everything that's happening. And as you can imagine, the collective breath, as one of our leaders described, was just kind of a big, take a deep breath, what's gonna happen next? Well, the next thing that happened was all those soldiers said yes to Jesus as Savior and King. One of the soldiers walked up to the front and said, I don't know what all has just happened here. I just know that we were walking past here going to go kill. And God told us to come in here. Say, stuff like that really happens? Yeah. You think God used those students? Yes. You think God continues to use students? Yes. Jonathan Edwards wrote about the first great awakening that, quote, revival has been chiefly among the young. Teenagers have been on the leading edge of every major spiritual awakening in the history of the United States. So I got a question for you. Is that the way we think? Or do we think adults are going to create something and it's going to be great and great things are going to happen? See, I think that's kind of the way we get conditioned. We get conditioned to kind of pass students along so that they stay safe and cool. And, and, and then eventually we, we, we pass them along into a college safe space where they even have a safe room to go to, by the way, so that they can then raise money and then hopefully have enough money to then move into Flower Mound where they can find a church and raise their children and do the same thing. And I just wonder, I just wonder if maybe what God is saying, no, listen, my whole word is screaming out to you I want to use young people to bring about spiritual awakening and revival all around the world and in your country. And if you keep looking at adults to be the ones to do it, then you're missing the fuel for the fire, you see. So what do we do about it? You say, you've been, you've been talking for a while, Randy, and you haven't given me anything of what to do. <laughs> So let's close up this way. I'm thinking about moments of opportunity and I'm thinking, you know, when a child comes into your life, you are personally representing Jesus to that child if you're a follower of Jesus. And that thought needs to control everything that you do. So I don't, I don't, I'm not a great model. I don't see myself as Paul. I don't see myself as passing the torch. No, hear this. When a child comes into your life, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then you are personally representing Jesus to that child. And that thought needs to control all that you do. I don't know what the Spirit just spoke to you about that. It's probably different for every person in the room. I think God is calling us and rising up coaches and pastors and parents and educators and band boosters to go about reaching this generation like never before because there's a huge generation coming 
maybe not quite as in the numbers in the United States as in other parts of the world, but with significant challenge, more than we've ever seen in a generation. And I'm not sure we're ready. So maybe more than anything else, this message is just to say, God, will you just help me get my house in order? Help me, God, put me in front of the mirror so that I can see everything that you're calling me to be so that I'm ready when you call me into the life of a child. So that I can be ready to impact the next generation as I am focused and present. Meaning I take my phone and I don't bring it to the dinner table. Meaning I have a conversation with a child that has no technology, you see, so that we can be all there. So that I can love them unconditionally because you see what a teenager wants or needs is to discover who they are and why they're here. And that's going to go all kinds of different directions until finally. But you see, are we loving them unconditionally through it all? Are we asking good questions? Some of us, we don't ask good questions and then we get the grunt and we wonder why. Have I prepared with a little bit better question? and a little bit better environment to engage? Am I learning their name? You say, I know, the, I know the names of my family. Do you know some names of kids that run around out here? Do you know their name if they weren't wearing a check-in tag? Do you know what's going on in their life? Are you affirming often? Because you know what? This generation that we're living in and Gen Z and the one that's coming in, They get ripped to shreds every day. Many of them, the reason they're leaving some of the environments they're in educationally is not so much because of COVID, but because they can't handle the emotional challenge of being torn apart by an increasingly secular, progressive society. Do we go the extra mile? Do we create guardrails? You know, James Dobson used to always say, Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. There is a sense that we need to speak truth in love, you see. And here we go, be the parent. Say, I'm not sure what all that means. right? I'm gonna do a parenting class in January. Come check it out. We'll get specific. And next, just represent Jesus. You say, well, what, 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 give me more. Okay, uh, here's some words I just wrote down as I was just processing this. And again, I don't know exactly what this means for you, but maybe it just means God's calling you to pray for this generation and the next like never before. Like they're at the top of your list. They're under so much challenge and pressure. Because you know what? Here's the deal. <laughs> for I know the plans that I have for you, right? We, we've used and misused that passage a lot, especially when we start talking about, you know, seniors and graduation. I've got one about to graduate now and it's all fine and good. And it's true. God has great plans for you. He has great plans. Can I tell you who else has great plans? Mark Zuckerberg. No, he, he does. He really does. Matter of fact, he unveiled him two weeks ago before I left for Liberia. He said, I got a great plan for you. My plan is for you to live in a metaverse world where you spend Bitcoin to be all present in digital clothes that you purchase, to live in a digital world that you create, to interact with digital people, to ultimately be sexually stimulated in digital ways, So that then at the end of all that experience, I can take off those goggles and be more depressed about my current life than ever before. Say, really? Yes. Yes, tens of billions of dollars are being spent on that experience for your kids and your grandkids in less than 10 years from now. That is the plans that they have for them. And so whenever I look at Liberian pastors and they say to me, Islam is headed from the north to the south and we know we have a short period of time to grab the attention and the heart and the soul of these teenagers in this country. What I say to you is, do we live with that expectancy? With that attention? With that focus? With that awareness? Because people do have plans for your children and grandchildren. And the question is, are you willing to be proactive? 
to pray and to give and to serve and to mentor and to parent and to disciple. In the book, Sticky Faith, Kara speaks about students sticking to their faith post high school. And the response in the book was, Here's an opportunity that the church has to invest in five adults for every one child. So that if they do that, the statistics are proving in our country, at least, that there's a 90% retention rate that students don't just graduate from high school in Jesus, but they stick with Jesus. So the question is, how are you engaged in the life of the next generation? What does that look like for you? Say, I don't, I don't really know, Randy. I don't really understand what God is doing. I just came in here because this is a part of what we do. And I would say, yes. But the generation that's heading this way is on fire. And what we want to do is meet them with the gospel in a relational way and point them to Jesus. you close your eyes with me? Father, the message to us feels heavy in ways because we're still trying to process, I believe, what it is that you want from us. But God, all around the room, there are children and grandchildren represented. And some of them, some that fit in these categories are gonna be in our homes this week. God, may we represent you well to them. God, if there's something different that you're calling us to do or more that you're calling us to do, God, as a church, may we just be open and listening to you. Father, would you stir us up so that we are not only focusing on one leg, two legs of the journey, but this third leg. God, I thank you for a church that is living out the great commission and great commandment. Father, may we do more of that in our lives, in our homes, in our families, and around this world.